about the devil doing all of these things um it makes it sound like the devil is close to being omnipresent or omniscient so how much of this is demons versus the devil does the devil himself possess right. people or is it demons you know you tell me and we'll both know uh, so you know look demons are master manipulators they're very proud of their manip manipulation they're arrogant more arrogant than anything you've ever seen they are they live in a world of filth lying sin rebellion you can't ever trust a single thing a demon says huh. outside of this particular exorcism and the liberation of this particular individual i see so we compel them to say the truth in this matter right in in, in this matter here in order to get you out of mrs shep house Right? I compel you to tell me the truth. But, you know, was it you that really manipulated that election in the third world country? Was it you that did? As soon as you ask that, right, you, you've now allowed your curiosity. Mm. And you can trick yourself. You can lie to yourself and think, you know, this, I'm really achieving good with this, you know, and doing this because we're getting to the bottom of the end. I really want to help humanity. This is false. This is, you are going to the demons to try to obtain knowledge by by definition, that is an act of the occult. By definition. Right? That's a sinful thing. So I don't trust anything they say. I don't engage in dialogue with them. I issue commands. I give commands. That's it. Uh, if they don't give me enough, I command them to give me more. For this case. And then when they're dispatched, they're dispatched. That's it. I don't care anymore. Mm. I may encounter in a subsequent case a demon who identifies himself as the same one that was here in Mrs. Shep House. It's a new time and a new place. And you know what? He, he feels familiar. Gosh, yeah, this has the same kind of feeling. Is it the same demon? I don't know, because they are master manipulators. I don't care if it's the same. I don't care if it's different. So for you, you know, for, for anyone to come up with, for example, because I'm asked this all the time. Hey, I even had people write me and say, volunteer, hey, Father, I... I'm a software engineer and I can design a great database that, you know, I could help you put together that would help exorcists everywhere, uh, a kind of a, a database, a repository of different demons and their characteristics and stuff. You know what? They had a characteristic there, that place, that day, mm. or this case, and then they go into a different, and, and they're completely different. They're all showmen. They're, they're all academy award-winning actors and they're also far more intelligent than us wouldn't it be like toddlers trying to understand grown-ups exactly. and coming up with a crude spreadsheet exactly you know um angels demons are nothing but fallen angels angels themselves they an angel the word angel denotes an activity rather than a species so angel means messenger right so an angel is a messenger of god but he is he's only an, an angel so saint gregory the great teaches us when he is delivering a message the word angel hmm. does not denote a species like dog hmm. doberman you know and but we as humans we we think of demons as species of things well what kind of demon did you have you know did you have a this kind of demon or that kind of demon hmm. and and you think well this demon, this is his nature. He acts in this manner. So you go into a different situation, he's going to act in that manner. No, that, that's not the case. That, nowhere is that necessarily a part of the script. He, he can completely change, offer a completely different name, uh, and exhibit a completely different personality. And anybody who says that's impossible, that doesn't have a, a notion of what he is talking about. Mm -hmm. Nowhere. Nowhere in Revelation does it say they have to function according to a particular nature, a particular uh, set of behaviors and characteristics. I, I began asking what other ways a person may know if they're being, if they are possessed. And mm -hmm. I imagine it's a very small minority of people. Relatively so, yes, thankfully. 
Uh, one would be feeling kind of nauseous in the side of the sacred. The other would be what was what would just real oh, quick. What would some just any aberrant behavior, obsession? Oh yeah, the other one you said was blackouts. Okay, blackouts, uh, obsessive behavior, uh, even even like a, 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 an aversion to anything religious. Yeah, or an extreme attachment, extreme attachment to religious things. Hmm. So uh, the the finest example we have in the history of the saints is probably St. Ignatius Loyola, who who decided to grow his hair long, grow his finger la- nails long, and start looking disgusting and live in a cave. And all of a sudden it dawned on him because he started reflecting on I this. I didn't know about this. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. He started reflecting on this, and he said, you know what? In doing this, I think I'm doing God's will. But I don't have any proof that I'm doing God's will. I, I don't have any proof that in doing this, I'm pleasing him. I am just made the assumption that taking the hardest road in life, mm. giving up all comfort, that that's what he wants for me automatically. But that's an assumption. He didn't tell me that. I decided to do this. Uh, and so in a moment, he started reflecting on his experience. And the one thing that he was, was an absolutely brilliant psychologist and he started to analyze his experience for um, accuracy in terms of is it a genuine religious experience is this positive or not and well he came to the conclusion no that this i'm being manipulated to keep me from doing what god really wants to do with me mm. so uh, an extreme propensity for religious things uh, sadness depression and anything that might look that like somebody is ill, right? And and that's a great cover for the demons. Mm. You no, know, Uncle Louie, he's just sick. Well, he just it happened two years ago. He doesn't really leave out of bed. And so you think it's a medical issue. Yeah, he's gone to all the doctors and then they can't find anything wrong with him, but there obviously is something wrong with him because he had no energy. But nobody has ever uttered a prayer around yeah. him. Or if they tried, you know, he, he, get out, get out. I'm tired, I'm, I need to sleep. But no one has really done a diagnostic. Right, Didn't, done done something subtle uh, that you you really you close the the mouse holes so that no other explanations could be had, and now you really render mm. uh, you perform an activity so you can render a diagnosis. Can only priests perform exorcisms, or can any of the lay faithful and even those non-Christian do so? Right. So um, the rite of exorcism, so the ritual that we have. In the case, may only be performed by a deputed priest in the church. So, uh, so that that's right in the rules. Um, if you violate that, then you are sinning, and you're going up against to the father of sin, being one of his children, and you're trying to command him. It would be very dangerous for you. Um, if you were to be a non-priest, and you sit like the the movies. The Conjuring movies, which which the, there are a series of horror movies. Mm-hmm. Uh, so you have this. Um, uh, they're based on loosely on the life of a couple, uh, the Warrens. Which in the movie he picks up the rite of exorcism, and and starts reading it, commanding the demon. So so again, th- this is part of the great big beef I have with Hollywood that you reduce exorcism ministry to magic. The ritual mm. becomes a magical ritual, and all you need to do is read this, and the, and the demons have to obey. That the church, at the end of the day, is an author of a magical book, mm. and that's why it has to. Nothing could be further from the truth. Built into that ritual several t- several times is the priest referring to his own priesthood. You go there and you mm-hmm. start reading this, and you don't have the priesthood, and you're identifying yourself as a priest. Again, be very dangerous for you. So this is a method that the church has developed for attacking demons. But that method in and of itself was published only 500 years ago, right? For the first 1500 years of the right. church, we didn't have a ritual. So, so what did the church do? It prayed. Oh. <laughs> so oftentimes, in fact, I don't use the ritual. I just pray. And I find I get quicker results in that manner. Mm. So what is it that I pray? I don't know. Depends on what moved me, moves me that day. It might be the rosary. It might be just vicariously praying, just spont- spontaneously praying, invoking God upon this person. And, and um, uh, that's my preferred way. 
if mm. I encounter a belligerent demon that is stubborn for whatever reason, and I have no access to the human being, to the person, then I, I will use the ritual in order to hammer him, shut him up, wound him. That might go on for many weeks right? until there's enough of a beating up that has been done that, okay, I have a little bit of access to the person now. Now I can get them involved. Okay. Right? That's what you want, right? The whole thing is about relationship. You want to end one relationship and establish another. So what could a lay person do if someone asked them to pray for them because they thought they were being harassed by a demon or maybe even possessed? Right. So uh, I think that the safe thing to do is to always ask Jesus to liberate this mm -hmm. person from any and every demon. And I said, now, uh, that's with regard to a friend, a colleague, somebody at church with you. Moms and dads, you have a spiritual authority over your children. So you tell the demons and you order them the hell out mm -hmm. of your children's lives. And my wife, presumably, is the priest of my house, for example. That's right. <laughs> Your wife as the priest of no, your house. I'm the priest of my house. Oh. So I have authority over my wife over and children. Your wife. Right. Exactly. That's what exactly. I meant. It wasn't a joke. Exactly. Yeah. All right. So absolutely. And 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 it's foolish if you don't take that authority. Yeah. Right? It's foolish. You you have an authority. Um now, that being said, I want to be really clear with folks. Don't go to the nearest strip club. Don't go to the nearest fortune telling <laughs> place. And you start casting out demons. Why? Because you don't have any authority to do that. And even I, I don't have the authority to do that. Right? And you, in doing that, what you're going to get is blowback. And that blowback mm. may, might take the skin right off of you. Right? Because they're going to come and defend life and property. Well, gosh, you know, why can't I do this? They're, they're, they're against God's will. They're doing something really sinful. They're doing something that really is aberrant and shouldn't be done and so forth. Well, that person who, 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 who is this fortune teller, she has the right to belong to the devil if she wants. She has the right to have a relationship with him if she wants. You don't have the right to end that relationship. Who are you? I see. And if God permits it, who are you to say it shouldn't exist? What authority do you have? You have no authority. Interesting. And so I, I remember, in fact, years ago, there was a a priest uh, from a different religious community, he was saying how they had a, a couple of, you know, well, a few novices, a few um, first year seminarians that were joining the community. And that is exactly what they decided to do. They went to the, you know, the, the, the little bruja down the street, the, 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 the witch, the person that you could go there and, you know, for 20, 30 bucks, you'd put a curse on whoever you wanted. Mm. They put their hands up against the brick of that, that building and just cast out the demons. Well, they went back to their friary that night and the paintings started throwing themselves off the wall and the, uh, crazy screams throughout the place. And um, it became a little shop of horrors overnight. Wow. And so the next day they had to do an exorcism of, of, of the place, right, to get rid of the infestation, which they brought in. And then, you know, there had to be some deducing going on here. Wait a minute. When you guys came home is when this began. What were you guys doing? Uh, and so they admitted ah. it. All right. Well, don't do that again. I see. Are there exorcists who are more competent and powerful than others? Have you ever had to call upon a more senior exorcist to help with the... I think I think all of us have, have called upon our colleagues for help. No, yeah. no one is the whole... Only Jesus is the whole package. But you, you might call in somebody who may have a different insight than you have, uh, who may have encountered certain pastoral situations that you, you maybe haven't. And all, all of us are always learning, right? We learn from one another and you encounter new situations. And, uh, and it, you know, more of what we encounter doesn't make sense than it does make sense. So you're, you're going in mm. always with... A, a certain lack of clarity that you detest, mm. but this is just what reality is. Uh, so you, you go in with a friend that you trust. Uh, like I, I will not do an exorcism with any, with, 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 with someone whom I don't know. Um, and, and why? 
uh, the, the stakes are just too high. Like because even because you wear a collar around your neck, it, it doesn't mean you're a safe person. <laughs> it doesn't. I don't know who you work for. Mm. I, I I know I may know what diocese you belong to. Mm-hmm, I I, mm-hmm. I may know religious order you you are incarnated in, but that's it. Uh, so I I need to get to know something about uh, a person and develop and, and and just see is this person competent? Would this person be a danger in that room? Would would I be in any danger if I participate in any exorcism here? How can I be certain that this person is somebody who can be trusted? Whenever you perform an exorcism, I presume you have other people in the room with you? Mm-hmm. Yeah. That, that, that yeah, you sense. have intercessors, for example. You also, have also a witness. I mean, who knows what kind of witnesses. shenanigans could be taking several place witnesses. and you want to have... Exactly. Yeah. You, you have several people. You want to have somebody from the family there of the victim too, mm. if you can help it at all. Some people have no family. so. Uh, but you want people that are going to be your advocate in case all of a sudden there's some claim made right, that's what I that something untoward was done by you towards the victim because the devil you know in the state of possession he has access to your imagination and memory and he can plant false memories he can plant a false experience he can bend light he can cause something to appear in front of you that is really not there and no one else in the room sees it. Hmm. Right? You see it and you're like, how could you not have seen this? This, 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 this just happened. And, and so what you want is numerous people mm-hmm. that can vouch yeah. that you did nothing wrong. Yeah, yeah. You want mixed sexes. You don't want just men in there. Yeah. Right? You, you want women as well. So in, a, in a court of law, you, you want people in that room that if it came down to in a court of law, you look like the reasonable person. Mm-hmm. You took steps yep. uh, to to ensure that everybody's safety was being protected here and you were acting always in a professional manner. Mm-hmm. So you have witnesses. That, 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 I mean, everybody is going to be a, a witness that you have there. You, you have intercessors, you have holders to hold down the victim um, to ensure that neither you or nor anyone else is attacked. You have, if if you can have a physician there or a nurse or somebody with some medical experience, that would be to your benefit, if you can get that, for sure. Somebody skilled in in the psychological sciences, skilled in it, it would be to your benefit, especially when you begin a case, uh, because that person uh, can explain to you perhaps certain behaviors, propensities, and weaknesses that this person has and can explain certain behaviors based upon this individual's background and and trauma experience and so forth. Have you ever had a therapist um, talk with somebody who's been possessed and they themselves may not have been a believer, but they realize they came up against something they didn't understand? No, I don't. I don't let any non-believers in the room. It would be very bad. I, I uh, even mean as a referral, like somebody who referred somebody to you, even as an unbeliever. Although I suppose they would have a naturalistic oh, explanation. Have for that. they referred somebody to me? As yeah. A, yeah. Um, I have had that. I have. Um, And what happened in this, with this professional, is that he encountered behaviors for which his science could not explain. And and his own internal experience, he, he encountered evil. He felt evil internally. He felt a darkness. You know, he so he he felt the presence of the ancient serpent. Uh, and so having tried everything else and having, mm-hmm. you know, what was regular is every time he was around this individual, he was in a, a dark place, he was agitated, and he couldn't wait to break free from them. And so um, he came and said, look, I understand that you help certain, certain people <laughs> and, yeah. you know, could I talk to you about this? And uh, this is what I feel. This is what I experience, and so forth. Now, would I let him in the room in an exorcism? No. Uh, I I would only let uh, somebody with a robust faith life, a full out believing Christian, mm. because I I just I don't want to be response. I don't want to bring somebody in a position of danger because the devil is going to be under such powerful duress, under such pain. He's going to look for any mouse hole that he can crawl into. Uh, and 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 to defend himself, uh, and that'll buy him time, right? So now he's in a new 
he's gained jurisdiction to a new person. Uh, so he might still be in Mrs. Shephouse here, although she appears fine. The next year and a half, she'll be no problem. The, the jurisdiction that he has there is may still be operative. And so he can jump back in anytime he wants. But now it's Dr. Milhouse here. He's the problem. So I, 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 I'm just not interested in uh, throwing water on a, on a grease fire, which is potentially what would happen. Yeah. Well, we're going to take a break. And then when we do, we're going to come back and ask you about maybe more stories that you've experienced in uh, exorcisms. Um, you have a podcast that I want to tell people about. Is it called The Exorcist Files? Or? It is. Yeah. We have a link in the description below for those who want to check it out. How did that come about and what is it? Yeah. So I was involved in different projects uh, with the Holy See over the past number of years. And back in 2019, there was a gathering and there was a discussion. The, the discussion turned towards extra exorcism and spiritual warfare. And there was a, a, a lamenting that the that there's there's a dearth of proper and good formation, good Catholic solid formation uh, for the people of God in this. Uh, and frankly, that a lot of information that, that is disseminated, uh, that is being put out there, is tainted. It, it's tainted by alleged uh, apparitions, by, the, by messages from alleged visionaries. It's being tainted with, you know, just stuff is being attributed to Padre Pio that is absolutely false, that he just never said. Mm. Um, that even some, some uh, exorcists throughout the world uh, have published books or have... have um, uh, offered information that that is just false, like or, or it, it it's based on um, a theological premise that is heretical. Uh, so anyway, the the point being that uh, I was asked if if this would because you know I I I, I speak a lot. I do a lot of parish missions. Mm -hmm. I do I do a lot of conference speaking, uh, and so because I. So the opinion was that I, I teach reasonably well, that w would I be, could, could, could a catechesis on exorcism be undertaken? And from this, I encountered some, shortly after that, some statistics that just wowed me. And those statistics were, were they were done by two uh, survey companies. So one was Pew, and they found that in the demographic of 18 to 29-year-olds, that within a five-year period, the number of of those who abandoned religion altogether increased by one third mm -hmm. in five years. At the same time, another company, public policy polling, uh, discovered that that sixty-three percent of the same demographic believe it is possible for someone to become demonically possessed. Okay, so. You have in this one demographic, uh, you have an increase in irreligiosity right. occurring. At the same time, an increase of evidence. Something is happening in their lives that mm. is making them conclude the devil is real. Right. So this is this is a staggering. I mean, this this just jumped off the page at me. So I thought, you know what? Um, this helped me settle on the format for the catechesis. I thought, what I'm going to do. Is, the catechesis is your is, is, that what is you the, name podcast, the podcast. Yeah. Okay. So my catechesis, my way of forming people, my teaching on spiritual warfare and exorcism, is going to take the form of a podcast. And in 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 talking with my producer and talking with different people that were part of it, uh, the format. You know, I didn't want it to be a series of lectures because the very people that I'm trying to hit these non-religious right. eighteen to twenty nine year old folks, they're not going to care about a priest lecturing on mm. spiritual warfare. So what I what I decided to do was to give an account of my experiences and dramatically reenact them in like a 3D binaural format so that when you're listening to an episode, I'm presenting this case, I'm narrating the case, and the case is being act out, acted out by professional actors. Wow. And you sound, it, and it sounds like you are in the room with them. So you will hear that dialogue happening around you. So you feel wow. the situation. And I thought, you know, this, this would be the best way that I know to reach out to this demographic mm. so that I could 
attempt to give them some kind of a spiritual and moral compass, right? Excellent. So I Excellent. knew that I, I I knew that it wouldn't be ignored. I knew that it wouldn't you know it wouldn't have no listeners, but I I never imagined it would have the 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 listening audience that it has. So that this week we will hit three million downloads for that podcast. Mm. Uh, so uh, w- what is the effect? Uh, people, I have, you know, it's amazing to read the notes that come in. So the, 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 the website for the podcast is exorcistfiles.tv. And I, I encourage folks, uh, if, if you're interested in, in learning about the podcast, the, the information is there uh, uh, to be read. But, but there's also a sign up where you can add in your email. And when season two is going to launch... Uh, then you will be notified about it. But that website is also a way by which people can send me notes or the team notes, my producer notes and so forth. And I'm astounded what has come in from all over the world. Uh, people have, you know, there, there was one lady that wrote in, she said, you know, I, I was born really young and my husband was never religious. And we started to have children when, when you know, after, uh, shortly after we got married and he never went to church with us. So I've, I've gone the whole life of my children uh, without him coming to, to Mass with us on Sunday morning. Well, it, the kids are now a little bit older. They're eight, nine years old. And so, like, if Daddy doesn't have to go, why do we have to go to church? And so every Sunday is a war. Mm. And it's a war so much that she doesn't even, she can't even take in the experience at church because she's been clobbered mm. by every kid who can clobber her. Mm-hmm. And so she had heard about the podcast. She suggested to her husband to listen to it. And she never heard anything about it again. Well, months later, he came back and he said, I've just joined RCIA. I heard the podcast. It made wow. the spiritual acutely real for me. And I started going to Saturday night mass. They went Sunday. Yeah. And he said, no, from now on, we're all going to church as a family. You know, so it's having, you know, it's it's had the the effect that I desired, which was to make the spiritual real. It is not intended to be a horror production. There are parts of it that are frightening, and they have to be because of the subject matter. Yeah. But the whole point of the enterprise is to leave with a, with a sense of hope yeah. uh, and a sense of 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 joy that Christ has obtained a victory. Well, in a way, it's like you're doing spiritual jujitsu. You're taking or spiritual, whatever the, the martial art form is, where you take that person's attack and you use it against them. Right, right. Yeah. Yeah. I'm, sure, I'm sure Father Lambert gets this. I'm, I'm sure you get this. Do you ever have people say, you're just making things up. You, you're just looking for attention. You're just trying to build a podcast. You're just in it for the money. Yeah, and you know, at the end of the day, it's, it's not my job to convince those people, right? It's not my job. It's mm-hmm. my job to present the truth. And, you know, though, that same statement was said to our Lord many times, you know, you're, you're full of it. Every time he was denied, uh, every, every time he was questioned, that's really the accusation that's, that's being made. And in the end, uh, look, uh, what, what, what is God saying to you in your heart yeah. about what I do? Um, I could also see it be a sign of pride if a priest felt the need to continually defend himself against every accusation. Right. To concern yourself with that. Right. Yeah. It's not, it's, you know, uh, it's not my job to convince, but uh, if you want help, if you want help, I am here to help you. Uh, I'll be your best friend. If you don't want help, well then, hey, you know, so long. It was nice chatting, as brief as it was. I'm sure we'll have a lot of people watching this podcast who want to get in touch with you personally, you specifically, just as they might on your podcast. What do you say? I'm sure you can't answer every email. So where do you direct people? Uh, they can be directed uh, to the website, and, and I, I, I receive thousands of emails a month, so I cannot possibly answer them all. But they are they are screened. They are gone. If, if there's something that I can answer, that a way in which I may help people, I do respond to them. Uh, so, you know, emails like Father, can you please call me? It's urgent. I will not respond to those. Okay. Uh, emails that are sent in, you know, my. When I was 17 years old, I saw something while I was at summer camp. I saw a, a scary... Do you mind just bringing this mic down a little bit and pulling it in more? Sure. Yeah, yeah, that's perfect. Like that. Yeah, thank you. 
I saw something at a summer camp that was disturbing. I'd like to talk to you about it. Well, that, you know, that was 17 years ago, like we moved on, pal. Yeah. <laughs> there, you know, I just, uh, that, that would be lovely, uh, you know, a, a lovely summer's afternoon, summer's day afternoon conversation, but I just don't have time yeah, for those conversations. Yeah. So then do you direct people to their bishop, their chancellery? Yeah, if you, they? if you need spiritual help, you contact your pastor. Okay. And your pastor then will contact the, the diocese and then that'll start the wheels going. Can you say that louder for all the people in the chat? <laughs> Why is that? Are they all trying to get in touch with him? Yeah, there's just various versions of like, will you help me through Super Chat or through like YouTube uh, Chat? It's like, we've been trying to be charitable, but can you say that louder? Yeah, <laughs> just sure. repeat it. So, like, if you are in spiritual trouble, call if your you are, diocese. If you are in spiritual trouble, A, eliminate the sin out of your life. B, go to confession. C, tell your pastor and ask him for help. And please do this in this order. So get rid of this stop sin. Mm. Go to confession and repent. Then go to your pastor and, and state what's, what's happened and, a, and ask for his help. And if need be, ask for a referral to the d- diocesan exorcist. Uh, and then do whatever they tell you. Like, don't, don't, don't be telling the exorcist what to do. You are not there to give him orders. You are there to, to take direction. Well, we have a ton of questions, and a lot of them are pretty uh, exciting. I want to get to them. But I, before I do that, I want to remind people that Exodus 90 has something called St. Michael's Lent. It's not their thing. It's the church's thing. It's a practice of fasting and penance that's really fallen out of uh, popularity within the church. But St. Francis of Assisi used to practice it with with his brothers. It's a 40-day period of fasting, which starts on the Assumption of Theotokos to the Feast of St. Michael. If you go to exodus90.com slash Matt, you can learn more about it. You can put in your email, sign up, join the waiting list. There are literally at least tens of thousands. I, I would say that is a safe number. Tens of thousands of men around the world who are about to undergo this. Um, and it's, it's a great way to take your spiritual life to the next level. Speaking about repentance, speaking about increasing your prayer life, speaking about distancing yourself from avenues of temptation. This is a great way to do it. Exodus90.com slash Matt. Click the link in the description below. And sign up over there. Did you give a talk at a conference of theirs, or are you about to? Or uh, I have been invited okay. to. I've been All invited right. to give a talk. They're doing really good stuff. They are doing great stuff. All right, let's do this. Uh, maybe think of this as the lightning round, Father. Uh, it'll be. I'm sure we could dedicate a whole podcast to every one of these questions. But here we go. Megan M says, Father Carlos mentioned being the property of the devils before baptism. What is his view then on what happens to poor souls who die before they can be baptized through miscarriage or abortion? We have three little souls who never made it to us, and I can't fathom that God would create a soul only to give them to the devil because they lack the ability to be baptized. Great question. Thanks, Megan. Right. So look, um, God. God never gives anyone to the devil. So God created an order and human beings destroyed that order. And so God's offer of salvation is exactly that. He came and intervened in time to give us an alternative, an offer of salvation to stop the cycle of destruction. Now, with regard to your three little ones who tragically died before baptism, we believe in a merciful God. We believe in a God who is just and who desires the salvation of your children even more than you do. Because that desire that is inside you, he implanted in you. And it is a mere reflection of the desire he has. However, the church can only do what the Lord has given it jurisdiction to do. Mm -hmm. And with regard to being a mouthpiece of the truth, all we know with certainty is that those who are baptized are, and, and die in the state of sinlessness are assured of eternal salvation. This does not mean that your three little ones, your three unbaptized babies, are, are in hell. It doesn't mean that. But what it does mean is that until baptism, the devil has real jurisdiction over us. What that means in, in eternity, I don't know. I don't know what it means. I, I don't I don't know that. So look, I, I, I know a glimpse of it and I can flesh it out prior to our Lord's passion, death and resurrection. Every single soul went to hell. Every single soul. This means St. Joseph, right? Jesus's foster father, went to hell. St. John the Baptist, the greatest man ever born of woman, went to hell. But now hell had two places, okay. right? It had it had 
Gehenna, which, which translated means literally the garbage dump, and it had Shoal, which was the bosom of Abraham. And so the righteous went to Shoal or were in a state that is called Shoal, where they were waiting for the Messiah. Those souls that are in Gehenna, right. they, 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 death is eternal for them. Uh, now, that's not in, where Joseph went, to be clear. I'm sorry? That's, uh, just to be clear, that's not where St. Joseph went. He that's didn't go to the hell of the damned. For those the, at home. Correct, right. correct. Joseph did not, did not go to the hell of the damned, to be perfectly clear. Uh, do unbaptized babies, so, 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 so persons who died before they could make a conscious decision for or against Christ, who died without the grace of baptism, where do they go? The church does not have an answer for that. Not with certainty. The church points to a hope that it has right. that God brings out a happy ending for this. But that is an area of certainty God has not permitted his church to possess. Okay. Yeah. Can I read the catechism, which basically echoes what you just said? This comes from 1257, paragraph 1257 from the Catechism of the Catholic Church. The Lord himself affirms that baptism is necessary for salvation. He also commands his disciples to proclaim the gospel to all nations and to baptize them. Baptism is necessary for salvation for those to whom the gospel has been proclaimed and who have had the possibility of asking for this sacrament. The church does not know of any means other than baptism that assures entry into eternal beatitude. This is why she takes care not to neglect the mission she received from the Lord to see that all who can be baptized are reborn of water and spirit. God has bound salvation to the sacrament of baptism, but he himself is not bound to it. Um, the church has always held the firm conviction that those who suffer death for the sake of the faith without having received baptism are baptized by death, by their death uh, for and with Christ. This baptism of blood, like desire of baptism, brings about the fruits of the baptism, etc. Oh, here, here's the part I was trying to look at. This is 1261. As regards children who have died without baptism, the church can only entrust them to the mercy of God as she does in her funeral rites for them. Indeed, the great mercy of God who desires that all men should be saved and Jesus' tenderness towards children, which caused him to say, let the children come to me, do not hinder them, allows us to hope that there is a way for salvation for children who have died without baptism. All the more urgent is the church's call not to prevent little children coming to Christ through the gift of holy baptism. Right. Yeah. And I, I can give Matt, perhaps in this situation, a little bit of a, of a, of, of a liturgical hope, uh, a hope that comes from the church's liturgical practice, which, which is not just merely an, an administrative action. It is the present, the, the church's liturgy, liturgy is the presence of the Holy Spirit. Look, in what you just read right now, the church has a liturgy for the death of those who, infants who die without baptism, right? Mm. And it entrusts them to the mercy of God. But you know what? In the 2,000 year history of the church, it has never prayed for its damned, mm -hmm. right? So, so there's a segment of, of human beings mm -hmm. that, that were potential human beings because it is possible to be damned. So the church is not aware of anyone, not with certainty. The church has never made a declaration because it simply doesn't have the knowledge that person X is in hell, not, e not even with Judas. For example, we, 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 it looks pretty damning when you read the scriptures, but the church itself has never definitively, definitively declared that Judas is in hell or anyone else for that matter, not even like Adolf Hitler. Right? That certainty is not available to the church, but it, ha it, it prays for unbaptized infants. So that's a great sign of hope. Mm. Now, now, this church is unable to offer certainty. What With humility the church has, don't you think? Like, I love that line in the catechism that says the church does not know of any other means. In other words, the church isn't making this stuff up. We're teaching you what we received. Right. Uh, Susan LNFL says, what role, if any, does a guardian angel have in an exorcism? Does a particular devotion to our guardian angel keep us a little more protected in turning away from sin or any demonic influences? Oh, I would say it would keep you more than just a little more protected. You know, the, the guardian angel is there to be your agent and your advocate. Uh, you know, you, you were in trust from, from all eternity. You know, your guardian angel was known uh, that, 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 that you, you were his patient, your, his client, if you will. 
Uh, so to cultivate a relationship with your guardian angel and to and and what what is doing that do? You're in cultivating that relationship. You are giving him permission to be a greater part of your life, and and that is to your benefit. Uh, so so that will protect you more, right? It'll keep you out of more trouble. Right? The angels are 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 higher being than by beings than humans. But even they were created for the sake of mankind, for the sake which which is uh, their own humility for the angels that didn't fall is is something astounding because this superior being is taking orders on your behalf. And how how often have you failed him? How often have you made his job more difficult by your choices and 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 me as well for that matter? Michael and Angelina say, please ask Father if he has ever had help from St. Michael, Gabriel, or Raphael in an exorcism. What stories would he be willing to share? Also, has he used a a rock relic from St. Michael's Cave in Italy in an exorcism? And if so, what happened? So, yes to all of the above questions. (laughs) Uh, You know, what what help do they give? Well, they help combat the demon. Uh, If the demon is is really belligerent, and I I learned this from from a a priest friend of mine, Monsignor Pat Brenkin, who's absolutely outstanding exorcist and one of my best friends just an amazing 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 man of god uh and it was actually from him that when when the victim when the demon would break free from the holders and violence would begin he would call on saint michael he was michael restrain him hold him down and then you would see this person who is berserk and out of control sit down and, you know, and follow the exact command, put his hands flat on the table. The hands are put flat on the table. And there, there is, there's just an incredible anger mm. that is there. So the, the, the angels are very much operative. One of the things I ask in an exorcism, uh, well, I ask, I ask three questions. What is your name? For what purpose were you created? Who is your nemesis in heaven? All right. What, what, what saint is your is your arch enemy kind hmm. of thing so why why would i ask these questions because they give you really critical information and they sure as hell don't want to answer a single one of them so <laughs> you wear them down you wear them down so the name is how, how do you wear them down through praying stop stop no i'm going to keep going until you tell me your name okay um so the prayer is kryptonite to them right they're like you know how somebody putting a cigarette lighter to your fingertip, you know, they're, they're bringing it over at a certain point you reach your limit. I see. Right. That's like it. That. I, I, well, tell me your name or the, or the flame goes back to your finger. All right. So it's, it's, um, torturing demons basically. Well, I mean, you're, you're, you are proclaiming the word of God. They find it torturous. Yes. Yeah. Right? <laughs> right. So my job, I'm, I'm not a professional torturer and mm-hmm. I don't think in that way. Right. Um, and I don't take delight even in inflicting pain upon the demons because really? you know what? If I do so, mm. I'm becoming them. Whew. Interesting. I'm, I'm not interested. I'm there to do a job. Interesting. I want to do a job. And you know what? At the end of every exorcism, my routine, my team's routine, we're going to, we go to a Mexican restaurant <laughs> and I have a tall margarita <laughs> and, and that's, I, what do you I'm, get to eat though? Oh, it varies. Okay. Right. I, lo- I love carne asada. Okay. Um, the margarita is the point, though. I mean, I could see you need to wind down after an experience <laughs> sure, like that. Sure, sure. But you, you know, you're not, you're not a torturer. You're, you're not a, a torturer is by definition an agent of evil, or, and, and takes delight yeah, yeah. in that. And I, I don't, I don't take delight in that regard. That's good. I take delight in the fact that there's justice happening mm. at a cosmic level, at a grand level. But I just want to go in, do the job, and then I just, I never want to see that demon again. Yeah. Um, so, uh, I was, I was answering something or what was the question again? Uh, I think it was about St. Michael, Gabriel, like calling upon them in exorcisms. Oh, okay. Yeah. Well, there we are. Yeah. That's it. Have you ever asked a demon what they're like? Oh, nemesis I was telling... Can you tell us a story of like a, neme- a nemesis where you're like, huh, that's okay. Right. Yeah. That sounds cool. So, okay. The name one is obvious. Uh, for what purpose were you created? Yeah. What do they say? A whole host of things, I imagine. It's it's amazing. I was pro, I was created to protect virgins' chastity. Oh my gosh! I was created 
to teach men to step into their identity. This is the things I say? Yeah, because they were angels. I, I was created him. to guard trees. I was created to protect the world against fire. So you think about, okay, in Eden, right? In, in the Earth's <sighs> pre-fallen state, you know, could you have had a wildfire? Well, probably not. Why? There were angels there to ensure it didn't happen. Right? That's a possibility. Sure. It's a possibility. Sure. So, but, but you Rob, have... The point is that all demons were created good. But, but you know that the reason I most often have heard as what? to why they were created, and it, it astounds me every time, and I've heard it so many times. Yeah. I was created to be part of the throng that proclaimed glory to God in the highest above the shepherd's field. Like, really? There, God created beings for that event. He wow. created spiritual fireworks wow. for that proclamation. And, and, and the thing is then, you know, th those demons, so they, they react horrifically, for example, when you sing a Christmas carol in the room. Really? In an exorcism. Or, or, you know, the next time I went to Israel and I went to the shepherd's field, I made sure to bring back a bag of rocks, wow. right? So you take a rock and touch it to a demon who, who, who states that this was my purpose and he rejected it. Well, this thing now is, is the cutting edge of a blade yeah. that wounds him. So is this part of a test as well for you? I mean, how many people have you said, why are you created? Like I imagine if somebody's faking an exorcism Every, no, or no. faking if we're demonic doing, possession. If we're doing an exorcism. It's already been established. It's already yeah. been established. Okay. And the answer is always something like that then. Um, something like that. It, it's, it's like some holy purpose. For oh, which that, That's what I mean. Absolutely. Wow. Have you ever gotten something that was like singular? Like I'm the only one like for a specific thing? So I had one one time, and this will this will answer also the third question, um, of you know who's your nemesis in heaven. This will this will slide into that one because there's both 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 situations happen in one. Uh, so the demon at one time would never state why you know for why he was created. He wouldn't state it. Wouldn't state. We went back and hammered it, hammered that question, hammered it, hammered it, and then. You know, I just, I, and I was in fact assisting um, another exorcist with this one. And so I was in the room and I was praying and, and it just, it, look, it just kind of came to me interiorly, like dowry. I saw the word dowry, dowry, our lady's dowry. And I turned to him and he was proud and belligerent and loud. And I'll never tell you, you effing priests. I'll never tell you. I'll never tell you. I said, were you created to be part of Our Lady's dowry? And he just dropped his head in utter, utter shame. That he was created to be part of the gift God the Father gave to Joseph at the betrothal. And he rejected that. So wh which saint do you think we call down? St. Joseph. Joseph, right? So this guy failed to report for duty, right? So, and I, I had a relic of St. Joseph. St. Joseph's body was never found, right? So his, uh, we, we don't know where he was buried. It has been a 2,000-year tradition of the church that one day his body will be found. Hmm. It will be found incorrupt, and it will usher in a new reign of peace uh, in, into the church, uh, so this is even talked about in the Vatican, in the Congregation of the Causes of Saints. Uh, so it is not an official teaching, but the church's mystical tradition. So mystics in, in repeatedly uh, have, have received this message. And, and the telling thing is this, no ancient church ever laid claim mm -hmm. to possessing the body of Joseph, none. So what we do have is a cloak. Uh, in Latin, the word is a pallium, uh, a mantle, a cloak, uh, that after his passing, it remained in the possession of the Blessed Mother. And then after uh, her assumption remained in the, the, the possession of St. John the Apostle and then in the church. And it remained in Palestine until the fourth century when Jerome, the church father, 
brought it and the veil of Our Lady to Rome, and he placed both garments in the Basilica of St. Anastasia, where he was the parish priest. Jerome had immense power because he was the secretary to Pope St. Damasus. Uh, so those two garments remain in that church to this day. Powerful. Sorry, I was just looking at the uh, more comments that are flying in here. We have a ton of people interested in this topic. Uh, do you want me to send the Super Chats, Matt? Just or? send the ones that you are pretty sure I'd like to answer. You know, okay. we, we always prioritize locals' questions first, obviously. So We have two for 50, so I'll send those Whoa. for sure. Cardona says, if demons don't have matter, how are they able to manipulate objects like the example of the fan, the musical box, and the objects falling off the shelves? I understand they get the jurisdiction over the person, but how does that work with objects? Right. Because they're in a different order of reality. So we are in a we 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 are in an order comprised of of two principles, spiritual and matter. They are not. They they are in spiritual only. So the nature, our nature is confined to act upon physical things in a certain way. They are not. So they are able to do so. Uh, the mystery of God by which they are able to do that is a mystery of God. Uh, but they are absolutely able to manipulate reality. I mean, mm. and the fact that it, it, it's, it's biblical, it's, 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 it's um, a part of divine revelation, the fact that they exist and, that, and they can act on physical reality. They, every encounter of our Lord with, with a demon is an example of that. We have a super chat here. Thank you very much for the $50 super chat. This person says, One night I felt a negativity and verbally told Satan to depart from my home. As I finished my nightly prayers, I woke up to smoke. My home caught fire, got my family out safely, but now are suffering. Did I go about banishing evil in the wrong way? I mean, it's hard, right? You're, you're dealing um, with very limited information I'm here. dealing with limited information. You know, look... You can, you can have the demon leave, you can order the demon to leave your home if you belong to God. If you belong to the devil, he's not in your home, you're in his home. Hmm. So your words have no power of eviction, right? Because you, you belong to him and everything, everything that belongs to you is his. Ugandan Catholic guy. If you're from Uganda, hi. I was there a few he years. Did. He sent it in Ugandan currency. What a guy. I love you. He Thank sent you. us 50,000 of whatever in Ugandan. <laughs> I love Catholics in Uganda. I've been there to speak. He says, could Father kindly give an example or two of possessions he has encountered that resulted from sexual sins? Has he ever encountered demonic activity that was triggered specifically by someone watching pornography? Um, uh, so the, the answer to the latter question is Yes. You know, what has happened when people have committed sexual sin? Uh, oh, heavens, they, they become infected. So look, the sexual faculty is the way by which we bond with another human being, right? So, that, so, so the two become one flesh, we are told, when a man and woman comes together. So the sexual act produces mm -hmm. a unity. That unity remains long after that physical act is done, right? right? As, as you walk away from one another, that unity remains. And, and, and this is why Paul says, you know, those of you who go to a prostitute, don't you know that you're bonding with yeah. a prostitute? Not just for the time that you're physically together, but now what is spiritually present in one has been, is, has, the other has become infected with it. Mm -hmm. This is part of the reason why, it's not the only reason, but it's part of the reason why porn is so addictive. Because if you're la lusting after an image, right? Lusting after an actress, an actor, whatever, what have you. Well, you're bonded to that individual, but you're bonded also to every other individual who is also lusting. So you're becoming part of this nexus of powerful addiction. So aside from the psychological addiction, aside from you know, all of the other things that make that, that make a human being addicted to porn, that spiritual component is one to be reckoned with. Mm. So, uh, so what, what happens when, you know, does there have to be full of possession? No. In fact, the, the vast majority of, of, of spiritual diseases, mm. right, spiritual clinging are, are far less of possession. And, and I might add even far less dangerous. Um, you know, being possessed does not mean you're going to be eternally damned necessarily. Uh, you, you can be, you, you can be free of grave sin and, in, in other words, in the state of grace and be possessed 
And you can be possessed because you've been in grave sin, but you repent of that, and guess what? That, that doesn't get rid of the demon himself. So, so you can be possessed, you're in the state of grace, you die, Yep. It, it, the demon leaves you, and you go on to eternity, internal blessedness, right? No problem. But, but far more dangerous is the temptation that we get under, right? That's the ordinary demonic activity, and that's the only one that has the power to damn us, right? Temptation to sin. And if a demon is hanging around us, he has picked up some jurisdiction. It's not strong enough to be anything too, too oppressive. But uh, he is making a certain aberration appealing to you, uh, a, a certain type of, of image you shouldn't have, a perversion. Uh, that, that is entirely possible. And, and that is something that, uh, you know, you, you would be better off, perhaps, with a full-out possession then in that state. Mm. This person asked to be anonymous. He says, if we feel on a spiritual attack, is it dangerous to address the entity that may or may not be there without mentioning Christ? For example, after my deliverance experience from an obsessive oppressive state by my bishop, I now often say, go away, usually more colorful language when I feel something. I've started including in Christ's name, I command you to go away. I think that would be highly prudent. Right. I, yeah, I, 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 so. I, I think I think you would you would to invoke the strong man that that has evicted Satan as the prince of this world. I, I think that would be a, a good move to do. Bob says, if you know you're possessed, can you self exercise via prayer? You know, that's a good question. I don't know. Um, certainly. Um, almost nobody I have ever met could do such a thing. Yeah. Um, is it in principle possible? I'm not going to say that it's impossible because I, I just don't know. I, you know, but, but if you, if you, if you are able to do so, it is because God sent a grace. It's done through God, not through your own power. God has had mercy upon you and, and has enabled you to make the right choices and, and has given you help. And you know what? It might be your aunt Sally hmm. who died 33 years ago and you were her favorite. And she's been praying for, for you from her place in heaven. And thank God for you that you have Aunt Sally. And you will only know this, you know, one day when, yeah. when you cross over into eternity and you see all of the help that you're able to get from these folks who in life you may have not given them a passing glance or just, ah, you know, Aunt Sally, she's fine. But, you know, I find her a little bit boring. She, she's, she makes cupcakes and they're all right, but I, I can't stand her personality. But you know what? In eternity, you will see what she did for mm -hmm. you. Travis Goldie says, I just glanced at the news and saw the director of The Exorcist passed away today. This got me wondering your opinion on these Hollywood films like Constantine, Nefarious, which is one of the best movies I've ever seen, by the way, The Nun. Is it all harmful or is there any good in these sometimes exaggerative portrayals of faith? I know a great many non-believers are sick of these films for the, for the faith portrayed. Okay, so I need some clarity. Yeah. The, the director He's of The Exorcist... He's saying the director... Can you look that up just to clarify? The director of The Exorcist. Friedkin. I don't know. Well, it's the original it's little... Exorcist. Yeah, that's well, what he's saying. He died. Well, heavens, he was an old man. Yeah, he's, I, not, he's not saying... He's not young. Now, there is a movie... Uh, called... William... Yeah, Friedkin. Friedkin, okay. Yeah, he died today. Well, God, you know, let's say a Hail Mary for him. Right. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother, Mother of God, God pray, pray for us sinners, sinners now and at the hour of our death. Amen. We have mercy on him, O Lord, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. You know, we're all, we're all going to go there one day. Now, there is, uh, so he, it was Friedkin yeah. who died. Okay. Because there is a movie coming out called The Exorcist in October. Okay. Uh, October 13th is its release. And it's, it's, uh, it's, I shouldn't say a sequel, but it's, it's a remake uh, of the original. This is the 50th anniversary of the original. The original was utterly terrifying is it called the exorcist believer colon believer the exorcist colon there was believer. probably some spin-offs of the exorcist or some sequels and there were tons. this might be a complete I mean, yeah, it's, got a, it's got a october release date oh okay this yeah. this this one uh in october has some of the actors in the original in it and your thoughts uh, i haven't seen it yet yeah so your I, thoughts on nefarious did you watch that i oh i absolutely did i and loved it nefarious is the ending was weird and not even in a good way but the rest was brilliant that was my uh, summary it, it was brilliant um nefarious is uh the best movie about 
demonic possession ever made easily easily wow. so so most movies get caught up with um and and the original exorcist movie did as well although it did it in a in a th that one was the most true to life of of all of them really um it's the most true to life you know people ask me you know things what happened in the movie the exorcist mm -hmm. uh, does it really occur in real life yes with the exception of one thing uh, the the 360 degree head spinning, uh, you know, so that can't physically happen because that would be a direct violation. Like a, it, it would violate the the laws of nature in such a way that that it would render, it would it would kill the victim because the neck is cannot uh, be twisted 360 degrees. Now, could there be the illusion of that happening? Oh, yeah, sure, yeah, yeah. the demon oh, is see. perfectly yeah. capable of doing that, but. But what these movies, beginning with The Exorcist, did what what they were were what they presented was the depth of the demonic power, right? The crawling up the wall, yeah. the levitation, and all of this kind of stuff. What Nefarious did was it brought you into the demonic mind, which is much more interesting. So that's the realm that I deal with. I see. That an exorcist deals with. And that, I will tell you, is at the end of the day, far more frightening. It's far more. Because, you know, if, if you saw somebody levitate in front of you, it would probably make the hair on the back of your head stand up. All right. Again, the 18th time, would it do that? I see. 118th time? Yeah, eventually. At a, at a certain yeah. point, you know, you move on. And, and so, you know, at the start of, of, of my career, I saw lots more of those diabolical phenomena in an than I do now. I see almost nothing now. And, the, and that's the same with all of us. Really? Well, well because they don't impress. So he and doesn't know wait, that. He doesn't waste his time. Now, if I bring somebody new in the room, if I'm training, so, oh, yeah, then, the, then the, the Academy Award winning demon comes out and, you know, watch this. I want to impress. I want to make myself big. Uh, I, want, I, you know, I, want, I want this person to be scared of my power. They, they just get off on that. What's the craziest thing you've seen in an exorcism? Oh gosh, that that is really hard to answer. I, I mean, I've seen levitation. It depends what you mean by crazy. But see, there's an external experience. There's an internal yeah. experience. What's what's I guess the most shocking external thing you've witnessed? That if you were to share it with the average man on the street, they would say, I'm sorry, there's no way that that... You know, they're, they're picking up a human being and tossing a human being across the room, like like as if it's like sheer nothing, like in, in a quarter of a second, this huge human being is being thrown across the room, a 300-pound man being thrown clear across a very large room, does a, a, you know, a flip in, in the air. That, w that was the same session where I, I, uh, I, w I was hit in the head and... You know, he, he came off scot-free. I, I, I came off needing hospitalization. Yeah. What about levitations? What is that? How does that? I mean, do you see that at first? The first time you look at it, you go, okay, something's going on. I'm not really seeing what I'm seeing. No. I mean, it hits you for what it is. Okay, the devil is here. So yeah. if there was any doubt in your mind, yeah. is there really a possession here? Okay. Yeah, that'll and, do it. And, and it just becomes for us matter of fact. Like, okay. So the laws of nature have here been suspended. And so you move on, right? You, you move on to now getting rid of the demon here. I've heard that another identifier that somebody's possessed is their knowledge of languages they don't have, shouldn't have access to. Is that true in your experience? Languages they have never been taught, correct. Yeah. Like not knowing a word or two or a couple of sentences, but perfect fluency. Perfect. So, so how about this? How about doing an exorcism and you're reading the ritual and the demon is saying the words along with you and, <sighs> and correcting your Latin? Oh, oh, oh. no. You know, so anything nope. to get on the inside, <laughs> anything to get into your head. So you're reading it and he's reading it along with you, not after you, he as if the person heart. hears knows you. knows it by heart. No, no, that's not the way you say it, you stupid priest. This is the way you say it. Get it right. Yeah, I would evacuate my entire... I would pee myself. Yeah, that, I'm really glad that yeah. it's you and not me. But again, by, by the eighth time, <laughs> by the 88th time. Yeah. Right? No, so, I get it. So it's given, fair enough. So given yeah. indefinite time. Yeah, you, and you start getting bored. What else you got? 
you start getting bored. And that's what the you demonic that power, yeah. <laughs> at, at, at the end of the day, the demonic power. <laughs> How much worse can it get? Shh, don't ask that. Becomes boring. <laughs> yeah. At the end of the day, the demonic power becomes boring. What, what, what becomes, what always is intriguing is, is what, what he is to, is to get into his thinking and to determine what is he really after? Mm -hmm. Um, Okay. Here is a question from Frank C. He just gave us a super chat. Thanks, Frank. He says, hi, Father, can you recommend a prayer, devotion, or specific modification that can help battle sexual immorality and temptations? The Rosary and Eucharistic Adoration. I want to recommend to, 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 to men especially, I've created a 21-day course called strive21.com, and basically every day it's like a three- to five-minute video. Tens of thousands of men are going, going through this, have gone through this. It's 100% free, strive21.com. You can go sign up today, um, and you might find that helpful as well. I sent you slacks. Okay, thanks. Uh, we have another question here. Um, Emily says, is it true that you have to find out the demon's name before it can be cast out? Or is it just a, it's just movie stuff? Uh, it's, it's helpful to find out the name, but it's not true that you must know the name. Um, someone is asking you to comment on Harry Potter. Yeah, you know. This... Just full disclosure before you say what you're going to say. I have no problem with Harry Potter. Yeah. I'm fine I, with it. I, it might be a bad piece of fiction. I don't think it is. I think it's a fine piece of fiction. Um, but there's my cards on the table. So so I I don't have anything against Harry Potter either. Um so you know, what would be what might be a concern at a at a general level? Uh, I mean what what's happening in Harry Potter is a blurring of the lines between good and evil. Uh so uh, you know, traditionally anybody who practiced sorcery was doing something bad. Um, now, do I think that kids will go away from reading Harry Potter and think and automatically think that um, casting spells is something good? No. Uh, will some kids? Yes, because right. of their own makeup, their own imagination uh, gets them to experiment with that and so forth. But, you know, if I had children, would I let them read Harry Potter? I, I would I would pick out for them better books that wouldn't have the lines of good and evil blurred like that. Okay, there's a question here. Could you help me pronounce this Thursday? Can you, uh, it's about the... Oh, so the Annalise McKell tapes, are those genuine? What's your opinion on them? Could you tell them? me what they are and then have you respond? The Annalise McKell tapes are recordings of an alleged exorcism done on a young girl named Annalise McKell in okay. Germany in the 70s, and they're the... That's the exorcism, the movie, the exorcism of Emily Rose was based yeah, yeah. on. You familiar with this? Okay. Your opinion? Um, so are the tapes genuine? Yes. Uh, they were recorded by the exorcist. And a lot of ink has been spilled over the, the Annalise case. And, you know, that poor girl um, was possessed. There's no question. Uh, there's lots of evidence. Um, it's one of the favorite cases for people... Uh, to poo-poo exorcism because they think that the uh, the exorcist and her parents killed her through starvation, and 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 that's not true either. Would it have been prudent to stop the exorcism as she was losing the amount of weight she did? Uh, m maybe, but you know what? It's real easy to stand back and judge a situation um, from a distance and say, you know, this is what should have been done. Yeah. None of her family, none of her friends. None of the immediate um, people involved in the situation ever suggested anything was ever done incorrectly or wrongly mm. or imprudently. No one connected with it. So I think the thing is, um, you know, um, it, the Lord decided for a particular outcome. Um, I, I, it's not my place to judge whether it was a... Uh, it was her time to go. It was not her time to go. I just don't know. But it was a genuine case with uh, a genuine, uh, I mean, demons. The, the only thing that I think was absolutely done incorrectly in the case, and I would, I, <coughs> I was, um, to say I was disappointed is an understatement. I was abhorred by the kind of interrogating that the exorcist did to the demon and by by the length of talking they allowed them to do to talk about 
matters pertaining to the church at large, matters pertaining to the Second Vatican Council. You're saying the priest allowed the demon to do this? Yeah. And this is all recorded? It's all recorded. And I would never, I would never, ever give a demon a microphone for anything other than this case at hand and you're exiting this victim. Why That's did it. they record it, do you know? Um, they recorded it. See, at the time, like, like we, were, we were absolutely forbidden to record anything now. Um, anything that's recorded, for example, could be subpoenaed in a court of law. Mm. And let's say, for example, okay, you, you picked up a demon here, there, or anywhere. Uh, w would you want your state of possession to be broadcast, like to become part of the public record? I would not want that. I would, right. Nobody would want that. Yeah. And, and so anything recorded can be subpoenaed. Um, the only thing that I record is an intake form where I have people record, give me their personal details and, and explain to me, um, that while they will answer specific questions that I use to help me determine where the wounds are. Uh, and then those get locked into a safe. And then uh, at a certain point, I will assign them an alias and I will copy those forms and I will remove the original name and assign an alias. Uh, so that uh, their identity is protected. And uh, where I have those locked up, uh, you know, they're in my office, uh, I have somebody with instructions to destroy them if I were to die. Because at, at, at that point, they're not relevant any longer. Something that you and Father Lampert, are you familiar with him? The other exorcist of Vatican? Something familiar, the two of you seem like really chill dudes, like really kind of grounded, level-headed, non-sensational okay. guys. Wow. <laughs> And I imagine if you weren't, it's the you'd burn out quickly. At the end of this, is that the right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, like, I mean, how, I guess how how is it that you? Because I imagine it, seeing what you see and doing what you do, I, it, it, I can imagine it being very exhausting and trying on the mind to the point where you have to retire and allow some new fellow to come up through the ranks. Why? Why? Maybe maybe I've got that wrong, or why isn't that the case for you? I just have so much confidence in God. Like I, I'm just so delighted to be part of a, his team, you know, and, and his sovereignty. Like, I have just so much. Look, the the devil will outthink me. The devil will outmaneuver me. He he has more strength than I have, but he does not have more faith in God than I do. Mm -hmm. And and that at the end of the day, you know, there it is. How important is humility for an exorcist? Well, gosh, I mean, humility is is uh, necessary for holiness, right? He, our, our Lady's great virtue is her humility, her nothingness. Unbelievable. And so, um, yeah. You know, at the end of the day, the Lord, the Lord is the winner, and it is the Lord who exercises. If a case goes on for thirteen years, I don't <laughs> view myself as, uh, you know, I I don't. I mean, you you will be tempted to think, gosh, am I really just useless? Like, yeah, is this really just. I just, you know, and you'll call in others here, like, do you want to have a go at this? And, yep. uh, but at the end of the day, he's the one that determines the day of departure, if he determines it at all. And we just have to accept. That's it. There's only one God. And he has sovereignty. We, we, and we just accept and obey. Mm. That's true in our own lives as well, isn't it? With the things we struggle with, be it sickness or sins that we keep repeating falling into being repentant of in the flesh yeah. we would like there to be just that one prayer but often we're being called to endure or if we our find the right rosary yeah, the yeah. right devotion if we you know the right the right apparition of our lady and read the right messages and all of that, the right parish program that we do this is good this is really important to say because because i find that people who in my estimation, tend to be a little obsessive about the demonic, also tend to be doing what you're doing there. Like they'll, they'll start ordering other people to do the devotions they're doing right. or to wear the kind of scapula right. they're wearing. Right. Why is that possibly problematic? Because it places too much emphasis on technique and on stuff. Yes. Right. We're not a people of technique. We're a people of relationship with God. You know, so look, I think a lovely devotion, a wonderful devotion is the chaplet of divine mercy. I almost never pray it. Mm -hmm. Like I, I don't pray it every day and, and not because there's anything wrong with it, but I just. There's a uh, lot of devotions. There's a lot of devotions. And, and I just, you know, that time at three in the afternoon, 
I'm doing something. I, like, I, I just can't drop what I'm doing at that time every day and, and just de- say the prayer. But even at other times, like it, it's, um, I will pray that devotion. But if, if I'm around the dying, sure I will. Um, I, I, and I enjoy doing it. But really, it, it takes a special occasion or somebody dying uh, for me to pray that devotion. But there's nothing wrong with it. Mm-hmm. So if somebody were to say, well, Father, and I, <coughs> and I know, I guarantee, because I just said this on oh, the air, I'm going to get emails, yeah. I'm going to get messages through my website of people saying, Father, you just don't understand the importance. Yeah. And and maybe I don't. I think, we're, I think we should be of the opinion that if the church doesn't mandate something, nor should you. Right. Right. So right. to look at our Eastern Catholics and condemn them for having different devotions seems right. highly arrogant. Right. Right. In my estimation. Um, what do you think of the screw tape letters? Uh, I'm not uh, sure if I'm sure you've read them. Sure. And, yeah. Um, what do you think of Lewis's concept of, if you remember this, demons being assigned like angels? Um, I, um, th- th- that does happen. Uh, we, we, we encounter that reality. Uh, we encounter that when especially when you 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 crack open a case you crack open a kind of stronghold in someone and uh you you isolate a demon and you know you forbid him to even leave until you say no no you will remain here until you are cast out you will remain and and at this point you know if he's been weakened enough and he's and he's just being leveled with prayer uh, then you know, why are you here? What rights do you have? What other demons are here and what rights are at play? And then, and you will, you will occasionally hear that we were assigned. We Mm -hmm. were assigned over this family. We were assigned over people coming from this nation. We, we were assigned to do this, to do X. Um, I'm curious about this scripture verse. Um, let's see if I can. You want me to find it? Uh, it's the one where he talks about you know, a demon comes and it goes and you sweep the house clean and it comes right. back with a myriad of... I when think a it's demon, from Matthew's When a gospel. demon leaves a place, it wanders through... It's, it it yeah. is in Matthew. It wanders through arid wastelands, seeking comfort, yeah. but finding none. Right? So that... Then in it and goes it, and... Yeah, okay. And when it... So then it says, I will return to my house from which I came. And when it comes, it finds the house empty, swept and put in order. Then it goes and brings with it seven other spirits more evil than itself, and they enter and dwell there, and the last state of the person is worse than the first. What does that mean? Well, so it means that when they're cast out, demons experience horrific pain, Hmm. and they do. And they do. They will start at a certain point in an exorcism negotiating. Well, if you let me stay, I promise I won't do, you know, I I won't afflict this person this way. I'll be better. I'll, I will allow the person to go to church. I'll do this. I'll do. This. They start making peace terms, right, which are useless, which which we of course ignore. But they will try to circle back and go back to the place where they came, and if they can, if they find it swept clean, if they find it hospitable to them, the wound is still there, and they still have the right. Mm. They will go in and they'll say to their buddies, "Let's go." And so this is why, unless I get a cooperation from people, uh, so again, I don't do magic, I bring Christ. And if people say, well, just, just get rid of the demons, just no, 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 no. Because if I do that, they're going to listen to me and they're going to leave. And what, what's going to happen is the fulfillment of this scripture. They're going to come back with six demons more, more, seven demons more powerful than themselves. And then your second state is going to be worse than the first. And you know what you're going to say? That SOB priest Martins came here and he made things worse. Okay. That's what you're going to say. Yeah. So unless you, I will help you if you were helpable, if you're not helpable. Yeah. Call me, call me when you change your mind. We have a super chat here from Joe Souza. Thank you, Joe. He says, Hi, Father. I was a non-practicing Catholic and had a spiritual awakening this year after going to Jerusalem. Just wanted to thank you for the work you are doing. YouTube is where young people engage. Well, so thank is, you. is your work on YouTube as well? Like your, you know, There's so, lots of interviews and yeah. stuff. Uh, you should post your podcast to YouTube. Even if there's no video. I'm sure your producer is, uh, is, is listening. You yeah. should post his podcast to YouTube. Um. 
KH sent us a super chat. Thank you. He says, or she, hi, father. Not sure if you touched on it already, but what was your calling to become a priest? God bless you both. Uh, I attended a retreat in uh, 2003 and uh, I, I had no intention of being a priest, never wanted to be a priest in my life. And I attended this retreat and I remember it was Tuesday morning, June the 3rd, 2003 at 10:18, And I heard the voice of God and, and it didn't come as an audible sound, but it, it came as definitely words that, that ripped right through me and that I just could not ignore. Carlos, become a priest. I promise to make you very happy. Hmm. That's, that's what happened. And then did, I went, did he? Oh, he, oh, he did. Yeah, sure. Yeah. I couldn't imagine doing anything else. Can you tell us as we wrap up about your, um, relic collection or whatever you, yeah. So, so I have a ministry of relics whereby I minister to churches, schools, and prisons throughout the world, uh, with a large, uh, Vatican sponsored ministry, uh, where I teach on the saints and I give people an opportunity to venerate the relics. Why, why would I do that? Well, well, what are relics? Relics are objects that have a physical connection with a saint or with our Lord. And they're usually divided into three classes. First class relics are the body or any part of the body, fragment of the body of a saint, bone, flesh, for example. Second class relics are anything a saint personally owned, an item of clothing or a book, for example, or any fragments of those items. And third class relics are any objects that have been touched to have touched in his life, like a, like a, a, a doorknob from a door that, that uh, a saint would have used kind of thing. Relics we hear about in scripture evoke healing. In fact, every time relics are mentioned in scripture, two things always occur. There, there is always a healing and touch is the way by which that healing comes about. It's not because relics are magic, but because God is very proud of his saints and he likes to draw attention to them by working miracles in their presence. So for example, in the second book of Kings, a man had died, was being buried inadvertently as his body was being lowered into the grave it touched the bones of the prophet Elisha. So the way they dug people into the ground, the way they buried people, they dug a deep shaft into the earth and then there were shelves carved and then somebody died, body was laid on its own shelf until that grave was full, then it was sealed and they started the whole thing over again somewhere else. Mm. Inadvertently, that man's body came into contact with the bones of the prophet Elisha. And it says he came back to life and came back and, and, and jumped to his feet. In the New Testament, in Acts 19, we hear about St. Paul the Apostle being so holy that when he would walk by, they would touch handkerchiefs uh, to his flesh and then lay them on the sick. And it says their diseases would leave them. And if they had evil spirits, they would depart from them. So uh, relics are have, have a healing effect and are exorcistic and and. Those things sometimes are, are two sides of the same coin. Some illnesses have their root in the demonic, right? In, for example, uh, we've done exorcisms on certain people that have tumors, like scientifically diagnosed tumors, like a particular cancer is identified and diagnosed um, that, that is not necessarily a rare cancer. Just, hey, we, we've identified this cancer here. The exorcism is done, the demon is expelled, there's no trace of cancer. There are no tumor, the tumors are gone. And all the effects of the cancer mm. are gone. All right, so not all cancers, I want to be very clear about that, not all cancers, not all illnesses have a spiritual root, but some do. Get your life right with God and a lot of that junk evaporates. Mm. So how many first class relics do you own? Gosh, in my, I mean, I work with the Vatican, so it's, that's hard to answer. Well, okay. Uh, Roughly how many first class relics do you have I mean, at your house? Oh, gosh. You know what? I more than e two? More than two. <laughs> more than 200? Mm, I don't usually give all okay. more okay. information right. no problem. than that. No problem. Sim simply because um, I, my, my house, for example, where I, where I live is not equipped to, to receive visitors. Yeah. 
uh, that want to view a relic. Fair enough. I, rem I remember when we showed up at the University of Toronto and we were in the rectory and you were unwrapping <laughs> something that just was sent to you from the Vatican. I think it was an arrow shaft that went through some Christian oh, and his, during his martyrdom. Yeah, that didn't come from the Vatican. That okay. came, so that Good was memory. an arrow. Okay. Uh, that was an arrow that killed a Jesuit priest in Vietnam. Okay. So it was a bamboo arrow with an iron tip and with, um, with a, uh, the bamboo feathers at the end of it. Uh, and uh, so that, that killed a Jesuit that had, uh, it has a Jesuit seal on it. Who the Jesuit was that was killed, we don't know. Mm. So a native Vietnamese discovered it. It, you know, so they discovered it and pulled it out from his victim and then returned it to the Jesuits. So the only thing he could say is one of your confreres wow. was killed with this. And he was martyred or just... He was martyred. Yeah. But, but we don't know. Yeah, yeah. I mean, is he an identifiable mar We don't know the identity of the man that was mm. killed, but we have the arrow and we have the testimony. Could you close us in a prayer? So sure. I know we've got these lovely men and women watching right now, men and women from all different backgrounds all over the world, right? Some are in serious sexual sin. Some have had abortions. Maybe some have performed abortions. I have no idea the kind of people who watch this show and they're listening to you and they want to get their life right with God. Can you lead us in that prayer? Sure, yeah. So in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, mighty God, I give you praise and thanks for this day, for this show, for Matt and all of the staff here and all of the people that, that have been viewing this show and that will view this show. Lord, I ask you to intervene in their lives and set them free from uh, that which they don't need and just allow them to experience your glory, your love for them, the delight that they give you and allow them to experience that delight present in you at their being. And so, Lord, impart to them a love of you, convert them and bring them into your glory in eternity. In Jesus' name I pray. In the name of the Father, the Son, Son, Holy, Holy Spirit. Spirit. And one last time, where can people find The Exorcist Files? Uh, on any podcast uh, platform, uh, Spotify, on Apple Podcasts and so forth. But the website, uh, exorcistfiles.tv, mm -hmm. uh, is where you can get more information. And there's a sign up there. We have a new season that is about to launch. And we have some interesting things that are going to launch for only those that are signed up by email. So please do sign up. Well, thank you. Thank you so much for taking the time to be on the show. You're very welcome. Thank right. you for having me. God bless.